Erev Tov, Chavri, my name is Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. It is March the 14th, 2019. And uh, the Israel Defense Forces are releasing a raw footage video here uh, wherein they are uh, showing uh, the sirens uh, going off in Tel Aviv uh, as two rockets. Uh, according to uh, according to the local officials there, uh, had come in from Gaza, long-range rockets. Uh, one of those was taken out by the Iron Dome. Uh, people, of course, uh, they show different videos other as well on uh, social media of Israelis going to uh, bunkers and stuff because of the sirens going off. And of course, most Israelis are a little bit more nervous because of the tensions that they're facing all over the Middle East, not just so much with Gaza, but uh, also with Hezbollah. Uh, we have tensions that are always on the edge uh, because of the Israeli strikes that are going on in Syria that have happened over the last uh, year or so uh, with Iranian targets. And of course, uh, Iran thus far has not retaliated, uh, but have, you know, threatened that the time would come they would actually do so. So I'm sure that makes a lot of people a little bit more on edge, especially as we're getting into the election season. So we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Israel's elections and also some of the things that are that the Israeli people are interested in. In fact, one thing in particular that caught my attention was a Jerusalem Post article right here uh, sp speaks here about 71% of Israelis uh, or excuse me, if Israeli Jews find Israeli control over the Palestinians immoral. That's a shocking article to see that come out on the Jerusalem Post. 71% of Israeli Jews find Israeli control over the Palestinians immoral. And I have to agree with them on that issue because there is a lot of immoral activities that are going on. And people, uh, organizations in Israel like Breaking the Silence have, have really risked everything, uh, people like Iran Ifrati, uh, for coming out and exposing the, the, the crimes that have been committed uh, uh, against Palestinians uh, in the, in the uh, West Bank, uh, in Judea, Samaria, and, and those areas there. So. Uh, but anyway, the article goes on to say, just in brief, new survey by the Van Leer Institute uh, in cooperation with the Citizens Accord Forum and the Sharit Institute revealed on Thursday that 71% of the Jewish public in Israel thinks there is a moral problem with Israel's control over Palestinians. Moreover, 78 of Israeli Jews think that control over Palestinians in Judea and Samaria is not good for Israel. So you have a large uh, ma uh, majority favoring uh, change taking place in Israel. And of course, Netanyahu is running up against Benny Gantz right now. And uh, Benny Gantz really, a lot of people say it'll just be a change of leaders if Benny Gantz actually gets elected. It's not going to really be that great of, uh, of a change, but yet the Haaretz is reporting Palestinians warm uh, to Gantz after remarks on the West Bank settlements. Uh, he, he got into the issue there uh, that uh, speaking about that what happened in 2005 when the there were uh, the, the removal of uh, uh, the, the people living down around the Golan area that no, excuse me uh, around the Gaza Strip, the settlements that were down there, that it was that it was even though it was a difficult thing to do, it was the right thing to do. I, I can't say that I necessarily agree on that particular issue there, but I do realize that we're going to see some changes coming in the very near future, especially with this two-state plan that uh, Trump is going to unveil. Jared Kushner being the head of this. Uh, two-state deal plan that they're that they're unveiling and I have a feeling we're going to see a division of Jerusalem there's already been leaks that they're going to divide the old city into half there's going to be given the Palestinians will be given the Arabic quarter and the Christian quarter uh, while the Israelis will take control of the uh, Jewish quarter and Armenian quarter uh, there is there is talks already that uh, East Jerusalem will go to the Palestinians and all these things friends we have been discussing with you guys for years on end that that is coming. It was a signed deal. It was actually done back under Ariel Sharon when that deal was first signed that would divide Jerusalem. Uh, and as we were told by our own sources that the Golan would go to Palestinians. Uh, now, I could see where that could come into play. 
regardless of who takes uh, position as the prime minister, they may utilize the Golan in order to relocate Palestinians in exchange for keeping settlements for uh, Jewish settlers with inside of the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, uh, which is kind of interesting that, that it's titled Judea and Samaria because most of the people that are living in Israel today are from uh, Judah or the house of Judah and, and rather not uh, the house of Israel. So Samaria should not even be occupied at, according to a biblical mandate that we're not allowed to move our stake uh, whatever the land, the way the land was divided, we're not allowed to move that stake. So we're actually infringing on lands that belong to uh, the Ten Lost Tribes, as, as some people uh, actually call them. Now, that's a different story altogether, so I won't get into that right now. And, and at the same time, I'd have to say, when Abraham came to the Promised Land, he was a sojourner, he was a pilgrim and a stranger. Abraham never drove occupants out when he was there. When he was there, there wasn't an issue of the giants in the land at that time. And so therefore, Abraham purchased every bit of the land that uh, he asked when he purchased the burial spot in Hebron for, uh, for, his, uh, for the burial of his wife, uh, Rivka. So we got to think about how we approach things that are going on here in the Middle East. And of course, back under the Ottoman Empire, Jews were coming back and purchasing land the way Abraham would have done. Uh, the only time that we have a right to drive out occupants is when we're dealing with that Nephilim race, as it was spoken about in the book of Numbers by Moses. Moses called them the children of Enoch, not Enoch, Enoch, A-N-A-K, uh, that they were actually descendants of, or he was a descendant directly of, of, the, of the fallen ones, the Nephilim, and uh, his children were Nephilim. So think about that right there. That's something to really wrap your head around, right? So at, at any rate, we didn't have that in the case of returning back to the land in modern days, and even though it's been a Zionist agenda that uh, has been for what they call the Greater Israeli Project, that has not really been true supportive of the Jewish heart, the Jews that wanted to come home to see the coming of the Messiah. And I think this is what we see in the reflection of 71% of the people uh, are not wanting uh, they're not wanting to see or, or they consider the treatment of the Palestinians as immoral. 71%. Uh, so Benny Gantz is kind of playing up on that. Netanyahu have a hard time to play up on it because he's already put it down so much. So it's very difficult for him to kind of play the advocate for the Palestinian people at this point. Anyway, uh, also, Israel suspects Iran of, uh, speaking of, of, of Benny Gantz, Israel suspects Iran of hacking elections front-runner Benny Gantz's uh, phone, and uh, which is interesting because Benny Gantz says, you know, this is he, he blames the Likud party of leaking this type of information. It was the Shin Bet organization that has released this information, but he puts the blame on Netanyahu's people for leaking that, uh, but he does assure the public that his phone uh, although it was compromised, it was five years after he was out of the military service, uh, and it did not compromise any of the security. But what does this bring to mind? It brings to mind the American election, and it was, uh, of course, it has been in, uh, um, basically, it was the Russians that helped Trump steal the election. Well, now, Netanyahu is going to play that same card, but instead of the Russians, he's going to say the Iranians are stealing the election. Uh, so I'm really interesting uh, to see how things are, uh, how the mud will be slung here. But there's a lot of reports, especially coming from uh, Arabic sources, that do not believe that Benny Gantz will be any much much any different than what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is, even though he's part of the left wing, uh, and and he's claiming that he's going to make concessions. <clears throat> the only way I could see that uh, the uh, excuse me. <clears throat> the only way I can see that Benny Gantz is going to make any difference is that it would be more for a new world order positioning. That's what I do see coming out of this, this whole election here. So anyway, though, there is something that really that threw me off majorly was Amon News, which is a Lebanon news site, uh, published this article here. Uh, today, new satellite images reveal possible Iranian missile site in western Syria. 
Imagine that a Lebanese news source speaking about that Iran may have a possible missile site in northern Syria. Uh, the article does go on to show uh, in, in their art, art article here, there's, they're, they're saying how the Israeli uh, satellite company there has re released these footages here uh, and that it could possibly be a place where they manufacture uh, missile engines and warheads in the complex. But they're, you know, of course, Amman says they don't know if they're really doing that there, but the mere fact that the Amman news would actually even suggest that the uh, that the uh, Iranians would actually have this type of facility there in northern Israel uh, really puts a slam on Iran uh, and, and what's going on and only helps justify or bolster Israel's uh, response and wanting to strike these types of locations. And speaking of Iran, Iran is also seeking key Syrian port of Latkia as a gateway to the Mediterranean. This is a deal that's being worked out, no doubt, with the Russians and the Syrians. But according to the article here, by October, uh, they are October 1st this year, they're going to take over the Latkia uh, base there, 150 miles north of Damascus to the Iranian management from October 1st when its lease expires, according to the Syrian report, which tracks growing Iranian and Russian commercial influence in the uh, war-ravaged country. That would give Tehran an unhindered access to the facility, which has 23 warehouses and was handling 3 million tons of cargo a year before the conflict. The port would be Mediterranean link on a, an emerging trade route through the so-called Shia Muslim Crescent from Iran through Iraq. Now, I find that kind of interesting because, again, it gives Tehran that unhindered access, but that's exactly what Israel has given China. Now, we already hear already from President Trump and the, and the whole uh, Trump... Uh, uh, Trump cabinet there that China's bad news or there there's really, there's really a bad situation that we'd be facing if we let China uh, continue to take control of the world and yet China Israel just opened the door wide open I don't think anybody bid for the contract for the port in hype but China just took it no problems asked and now they got Ashkelon as well this time they you know because of the criticism for nobody bidding on the hype port they had a few other people bid for it but China still got it so Israel doesn't even have a say so militarily about the ships at port at the hype port their military base because the Chinese control it doesn't that tell you something about a new world order is not anybody paying attention to these things you know you can't you got listen you can't look at Israel as a state that is truly a, a, a state that is being ran by God himself or something of that effect. That's just majorly a problem because God, for one, is not interested in the politics of, of this world anyway. He has no, no concern for this politics of this world. So when I look at everything that's happening right now in Israel as far as from a political standpoint, I see everything being set up for the, for the reign of an Antichrist system. This is one reason why a lot of rabbis in Israel are saying now for you to be condemning and saying that the Antichrist is going to rule out of Jerusalem, that you'll be condemning the true God of Israel and the true Messiah that is coming. Well, that lets me know they're preparing for the Antichrist reign. Because believe me, they're not going to say it's Jesus. I can tell you that right now. So we got to wake up, friends. I mean, listen, I love my people. And if you love my people as well, if you truly love the Jewish people, then there would be a couple of things that you would change. One, you would stop that unconditioned, unfettered support for a government that only wants to blow up all of our neighbors. You would truly, as believers in Yeshua, no, no less, as believers in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, why are we not teaching the love, the love of Yeshua? He said his kingdom was not of this world. If his kingdom is not of this world and he said, I'm going to prepare a place to where I am, you may be also, then why are we keep trying to build the kingdom here? All right, think about some of these things. When Yeshua was here, what was he trying to do? Boy, he was, if you want to talk about anti-Semitic, look at the words Yeshua deals with the Pharisees, which, according to Rabbi Singer, the, 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 the Orthodox Jews of today are the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago, and he boasts about it. And Yeshua called that group a group of vipers, 
a generation of vipers. The Hebrew Matthew calls them seed of vipers. And he puts the blame of every righteous bloodshed on the earth to the Pharisees. Now, don't mix up Pharisees with all Judaism because that's not true. Pharisees are the Hasmonean dynasty. That was through the Maccabees where they usurped the true Zadok priesthood and installed their own puppet dynasty in there to be the priest. According to the, uh, to the uh, Apocrypha of Moses, the assumption is they called them a slave class that came out of Egypt. Boy, you gotta, we got to really think about this. Look, listen, there is a remnant of Israel that is in the land today that's longing for the coming of the Mashiach, the true Messiah, not an Antichrist. And many of them, if we would just truly bring the love of Yeshua, would recognize that he indeed is the Messiah. And believe me, if he was here today, do you think he would be about blowing up Syria, wiping out Damascus, when the very prophet Isaiah even condemns Israel and says, you forgot the God of your salvation, and that's why Damascus becomes a ruinous heap? See, nobody's paying attention to the Word of God. They're more busy about their doctrinal opinions. Jeez. And then look, look on, not only that, look at here. U.S. State Department indicates Israel no longer occupies the Golan Heights. They're working on making sure the Golan is 100% under Israeli control. Now, I ought to tell you something. I've always kind of been split on the issue of the Golan. Because of the war and stuff like that, Israel has taken control of the Golan. I believe it should just remain the way it is right now. You can't wrong wrong something that's already you know make something right has already been wronged already but i do believe that it is going to be part of the negotiations between the palestinians and i have a feeling according to one source that i had that they're going to put palestinians up there but they're going to give israeli security of that region there for the protection of their border but put palestinians in there so that the syrian government would agree upon it i think that's what the new world order plan is all about but i decided to do some digging scripturally to see about the Golan. Now, there's two maps that you can look at. If you want to go back to the times when Joshua divided up the land, we have two different maps. On this map right here, we see the Galilee right here. We see Naphtali uh, there, and we see they put Manasseh over here to the eastern side, which basically takes up the Golan with Dan up there as well, right? And, uh, but also Manasseh has this portion of the land as well. Now, biblically speaking, we do know that Manasseh does control both sides of the river. But also Manasseh is part of Beit Shean, which on the left side we see that as well. But there is a debate among scholars of what the other tract of land of Manasseh is. Now I'm going to show you the scholar, scholarly debate. The first one you see is on uh, GoTravelAZ.com. Uh, That's their map using Canaan as divided among the 12 tribes. All right. Now on the tribal territory, this map right here, uh, and I know this is on Wikipedia, but Kenneth Kitchen who is a uh, also is an, uh, was an Egyptologist, he's a biblical scholar. This is the way he drew the biblical map, putting Asher, Naphtali right here. But he puts Manasseh, and when, of course, because we, we know that Manasseh had conquered certain lands there on the eastern part of the Euphrates, and so he, therefore he puts this territory here in Gilead, which is part of that territory that he, that he conquers in Bashan, uh, and he does not put on the eastern side of the Galilee or the Kinneret. They call it the Kinneret in Israel today, which means harp. It's shaped like a harp. Uh, but biblically, it's actually called Galilee as well by Isaiah the prophet. But in all this area here, this is part of Syria. And so I begin to wonder about this. Okay, because it's such a contentious issue today, right? And Israel does control kind of like this here, it comes back up and back in. Now Israel controls what we would consider by the other map, Israel controls about half 
uh, not quite half of what they claim Manasseh has, and they claim that to be the land of Bashan, all right? But Kitchen believes that that was not the land of Bashan, and therefore it was a, a Gentile area or a Syrian area for the people of Aram. All right, so I decided, okay, let's take it from the biblical aspect, because God's already said, and I've showed you that before, and I, I didn't bring it up this time, but the land, God says to the children of Israel, you're not to move your stake. Each tribe was given a portion of land. That was the land that we had, and we weren't to move our stake. We weren't allowed to be messing with the, with the with down here in Adam that belonged to, to, to Esau's children. We weren't allowed to mess over here to the Moab area that belonged to Ishmael's children. And even Jacob had made a covenant with, uh, and, and by the way, the covenant was made in Gilead, and it's actually right in this area here, which is kind of interesting. It's another scriptural point, too, that they were not to cross that pile of rocks to do either one harm. So that does kind of confirm that from here up, would have been a Syriac land. All right? Now, so I decided, what does the Bible say? First thing I did is I looked over here in Matthew, because Matthew, and even in the Hebrew Matthew, words are exactly the same. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, this is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. John was cast into prison. He departed into Galilee. All right? Doesn't say Samaria, just says Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the what? Borders of Zebulon and Naphtali. Notice that word, borders. He's on the borders of Naphtali. All right? So, and Capernaum is right here. And Nephtalim's border came to the Jordan River, and so he's close to the border. There's actually another little city right there. Uh, uh, it is called, um, I forget the name of it. I'll have to think about it later. But anyway, that's where he was at. He says that was the border. All right, Zubalan. Zubalan's down here to the southwest. But he comes up, and he gets right there, and, he, and he's close to the border, right? Now, as you read on in, 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 uh, in Matthew chapter 4, and, and hold on, my Jewish friends, I know most people say, oh, that's just Christians, they don't know nothing. Well, but you give me a moment. He's on the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. What? The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right? Now, this is amazing to me. Because the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea, talking about the Sea of Galilee, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So what is beyond Jordan? According to Matthew, and he's quoting Isaiah, anything beyond the Jordan River, Galilee of the Gentiles, was the Goim. All right? Now, so you go back to Kitchen's map. And that's exactly what it shows. Once you cross the Jordan River, you were in the land of the Gentiles, but it was connected to the Galilee. So I decided, okay, did Isaiah really say it? Now, in the King James, this verse is chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, I believe it is. But in the Hebrew, the way they've laid it out, is they have it in chapter 8, the last verse, going into chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 as well. For is there no gloom to her that was steadfast? Now the former hath lightly afflicted the land of Zubalan and the land of Naphtali. But the latter hath dealt a more grievous blow by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in the district of the nations. Okay, literally in Hebrew, all right, Derech Hayom Aver Hayudeach, Galilee, Galilee, Hagoim, 
All right, so beyond that Jordan River is what? It is Galilee of the Gentiles. According to Isaiah, now Isaiah, here's the thing. You know, one thing that might come to some people's mind, well, when did Isaiah actually, when was here on the earth? Well, he was here around 740 B.C. Manasseh goes into captivity around 7, what, 723 or 735, something like that. Isaiah's already here, and Isaiah's already putting the Gentiles in that area. So it has nothing to do with Manasseh going into captivity and suddenly the land becomes available. This is putting Manasseh as that map by Kitchen being correct, and this map here not being correct according to what Isaiah says. So, I know that there's different debates on it, and but I like to go back to the Bible. And again, I'm not saying, I'm not for uprooting where the issue is now. We have enough problems in Israel as it is. And I know that in 2011, Assad was willing to negotiate over the Golan uh, to begin with and to bring about a peace over this issue, but Netanyahu would not negotiate with him. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Assad was willing to even concede the Golan to Israel if they would exchange for peace. But it wouldn't work. All right? But if you want to look at biblically, this map here by... Kenneth Kitchen is the right map that seems to more accurately depict where Manasseh's uh, tribal borders actually were. Now, granted, granted now, I'll say this, part of Syria would be in Manasseh as well because you have to go look at a regular map and uh, we'll just put this on here, Syria, a map today. So let's just quickly look at this real quick, like, uh, to kind of, oops, didn't mean to do it that way. Here we go, right there. So we look there, the Golan, like I said, no, actually, even in Manasseh's time, they still doesn't even, it looks like that pretty much all of what would be Manasseh is actually in the country of Jordan. So even Syria's boundaries, still, other than it should have been right here, according to the ancient biblical map, according to Isaiah's prophecy, would have put the Golan in Syria's hands. And the reason why Manasseh was here was because right here in Gilead, which is right about here in Jordan here, was where the mount was built between Jacob and, uh, uh, and Laban, and where they made the covenant that they would not cross over that border to do the other harm. So they made their border here even. Which again, that border where Laban made, who was a Syrian according to the scripture, they put that border, let me just kind of zoom in for you here for that. Let's just really seriously take a look at this. Um... Yes, right up in this area right here, where you see this kind of this uh, forest type area right here, this is where that was that covenant was made that, that Israel would not cross that way because he'd be going into the land of Syria. And Laban would not cross back to do him harm. Isn't it interesting? I mean, we really begin to look at how God's word is laid out there. So... You know, Israel has kept that for a buffer zone, and I'll tell you something. There's not a lot of people live up in that area either because of that. But it is right there at Capernaum, and according to the Scripture, according to Jesus, when Matthew wrote it, that was they were at the border. He knew right down the road was the Jordan River, and that was the border of Naphtali. That was his, his ancestral home. That was his border. And beyond that, it was called Galilee, are Galileo of the going of the Gentiles. Hey, let's stay with the word of God. I think that's more important and it might even help to bring about some peace while there's what little bit of time we have left on this earth. I'm Steve Benoon. Thank you for watching. Uh, tomorrow we got some, uh, we'll be, be back on here again with a teaching message here. And then Saturday, 
we have got some interesting guests coming on two of them back to back here on israeli news live it's going to be a very insightful time i'm stephen benoon with israeli news live Arif Tov.